Welcome to Epicenter, the hub of innovation in the heart of Helsinki, where ideas come to life and creativity thrives, where innovation meets community, network, and make an impact. Let's go. Good evening, Helsinki. I feel like I have so many friends who are here on Friday. <laughs> who was here on Friday? Show of hands. Yeah, we had quite a blast, didn't we? Uh, I'm still feeling the, the effects of how great that was, both uh, physically <laughs> and spiritually. But hey, welcome to Epicenter Helsinki. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joey. I'm the head of community uh, here and so excited uh, that you're all here to be with us today. So we do things a little bit differently uh, here at, at Epicenter. So we like the vibe to be loose. We're going to have a lot of information shared with us today, but we want it to be informal yet informative, right? I also crave the attention. No laughs? Wow. I'll take that one. I'll take that one back. That usually gets a lot of laughs. So anyway, listen, we take, we take the first 10 seconds of each. So this is definitely needed tonight. We take the first 10 seconds of each of our community events here at Epicenter, and we absolutely go bananas, right? We scream, we shout, we clap. We're going to set the, the, the mind of our speakers at ease because they're going to feel like you're with us today, right? So let's take the first 10 seconds and absolutely go crazy. Go. Uh, come on, I can see you right there. There we go. These lights aren't that bright. Keep it going, keep it going. No, it goes good. Let's let it loose. There we are. All right, all right. Okay, so what that does, like I said, is that it sets the tone. We're all going to feel like we're going to have a great time this evening. But also, at every single one of these events, I record that. And then I play it when I get home. <laughs> like, great job, Joey! Woo! I've unloaded the dishwasher. Hit the record. <laughs> all right, now we're getting loose. We're laughing. All right, well... Uh, welcome to Epicenter Helsinki. We are a community and a meeting arena for local change makers who want to accelerate uh, and supercharge the local entrepreneurial ecosystem. The way that we do that is we bring brilliant people together to share ideas, to network, and to grow. We think that innovation lies within collaboration, and the only way to collaborate is to get up and to meet people. And so that's what we're going to do today after we spend the uh, better part of the afternoon learning uh, about this topic. So I want to welcome you to Hired. This is a monthly event series hosted here at Epicenter that discusses the most pressing topics in today and tomorrow's talent landscape. Uh, Hired is desired, uh, designed to foster a conversation that matters, bringing together industry expert, HR professionals, and thought leaders and the global talent community. Our series dives deep into a range of topics, um, like diversified leadership to nurturing uh, well-being in the workplace. And today, we're going to tackle the advancement of women in the global talent arena. Uh, we're so lucky to have five experts uh, in their own right to guide us through this conversation. We'll start the evening with a keynote um, that looks at unseen obstacles and structural disparities that continue to challenge uh, women's equality in the workplace. Our next keynote will uh, explore the transformative power of targeted mentorship and sponsored, uh, sponsorship programs. Um, and last, we're going to sit for a panel uh, where we'll discuss three pivotal themes in advancing a uh, women's uh, career. Uh, so we're going to look at fostering financial independence and literacy, uh, crafting and implementing inclusive workplaces uh, and policies, uh, and effectively managing significant career transitions. How does that sound? That's a lot, right? It's a lot. I've got to win the, the top part of the stairs today. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, by the end of the day, I'm going to beat you over with my smile. <laughs> You'll say, gosh, that Joey was so charming. I can't wait to see him on stage again. Okay, shall we begin? Yes, yes. yes okay. So, 
Uh, our first speaker is a graduate at the University of Arts London, where her background lies in fashion and fashion theory. Uh, she is an associate lecturer at the uh, University for the Creative Arts and Southampton University, where she supervises uh, student dissertations in cultural studies. Her own research uh, interests center around gender and equality, where she has written on girls' dress, uh, sexualization, and victim-blaming narratives in cases of sexual violence. Uh, more recently, she has begun working on a Finnish-funded book project detailing the normalization of physical pain over the course of a woman's reproductive journey. Uh, it is my esteemed pleasure to uh, bring up uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Siri Lindholm, who uh, will walk us through this keynote. Please. <laughs> this is for you. Thank you. Thank you, Joey, so much for the introduction. That cuts out quite a lot of what I was <laughs> going to say. But yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Lindholm. I am an associate lecturer in gender and culture. And what I do at the moment, which is kind of why I'm here, I look at gender in sort of societal and cultural level and how we normalize some of the things that are invisible to sort of the everyday person. And Thank you, Joey, again so much for inviting me to speak here. Uh, we had some conversations about what I could talk to everybody about because I've never really examined women in the workplace as such. But what I really want to do, because I'm the first speaker as well, is to look at bigger hidden social structures that impact women's lives and hence their ability to perform professionally. So this is what we're doing today and moving swiftly on to the first point. So what I'm going to do is start with a few examples of the visible policies that we have in place in workplaces to recognize the particular needs of women and their bodies. Periods are at the moment being taken into consideration in a whole new way, where countries like Spain are implementing period leave to acknowledge the physical and psychological suffering that they cause and their effect on women's performance at work. Widespread media discourse, however, threw spanners in the work in other places by questioning whether period leave frames menstruation as an illness and therefore women as chronically sick, and then how this would affect their credibility and agency as professionals. In Finland and many other places, you're not allowed to fire somebody for becoming pregnant. Women do not have to disclose their pregnancies until a rather late stage at work. And workplaces have to accommodate breastfeeding to mention a few practices in place. But again, we can question how many workplaces avoid hiring women of reproductive age in the first place to avoid having to organize maternity cover. And also, we can question how practical workplaces have made things like breast, uh, expressing breast milk, or do women choose to stay at home after all, because it's just not functional. Menopause has just been addressed in the UK in a comprehensive new survey into women's health more widely. It found that more than a third of women said that their side, the side effects of menopause affected their work significantly, and a staggering 10%, so one in 10 women, had to quit their jobs because of menopause symptoms. So this is an example of something that has been very invisible, but it's becoming increasingly visible. And here's hoping that employers will accommodate arrangements around this as menopausal women tend to be at the age where they're at the height of their career and bring a wealth of experience to their field. And finally, I want to give a very concrete example of visible disparity that doesn't have to do with the body directly. One of the most well-known inequities in the workplace is, of course, the bay gap between genders. In Finland, women earn on average 84% of what men make for the same job. And the reason why I'm going over these statistics is because I want to demonstrate that we do have data. We do have very good handheld concrete data that we can take into account and support women with. And it makes these issues visible and therefore solvable as well. What I'm going to do now is focus on the issues and aspects that remain invisible but have a huge impact on women's professional performance. 
So if we start off by looking at how women get to work, women are more likely than men to use public transport and they're more likely to walk. If they drive, they are more likely to perform care duties so they don't drive to and from work directly necessarily. They'll drop off children and check up on elderly on their way. Snow plowing patterns seem an unlikely subject of gender study conducted in a small town in Sweden. But after the implementation of a law that dictate that gender equality had to be considered in all public practice, they looked at how clearing snow might affect men and women differently. At first, the town's approach appeared logical and neutral on the surface. Plow major roads first, particularly those that lead in and out of town, followed by smaller local streets. It's the same sequence played out in many cities around the world, I would assume Helsinki as well. As the researchers dove into the subject, however, they discovered that male and female driving patterns are markedly different. While men mainly commuted to and from work, women drove all over to run errands and perform care duties. They also walked more, trudging across often unplowed intersections, sometimes with kids in tow. Aside from health and safety, that labor, when tallied up, was found to be worth almost as much to the economy as paid work. And I think that that's a really, really important aspect. So the stuff that women do that nobody sees is worth as much as men's paid work. In Finland, women perform eight hours of unpaid labor more per week than men do. So an entire workday's worth. So when the Swedish city council in question looked at the findings and reversed their approach, plowing side roads and sidewalks first, it had a huge impact reducing people admitted to the emergency room women in particular, and had a corresponding economic impact from lower health care costs. Driving through a few inches, as it turned out, was less dangerous than walking through the snow, particularly if you were pushing something like a baby carriage as well. Of course, the original plowing plan wasn't designed to adversely affect women. It was seen as the default strategy. But the outcome did show that males are often the default subjects of design, which can have a huge impact on big and critical aspects of everyday life. So when women get to work, problems don't get better. There is a plethora of examples of invisible barriers that hold women's careers back that I would like to go over. Being mindful of the time, though, I think I'm going to look at two examples of meritocracy and the glass ceiling. So meritocracy is the system where, in theory, advancement in the workplace and the highest positions are awarded based on merit. In theory, this should mean that talent, achievement and hard work should be awarded, should award the merit rather than social class, race or gender. In theory, this should be a fair system. However, it really ends up upholding institutional biases. Essentially, it appears standards of success are based on the white man. A study of 248 performance reviews collected from a variety of US-based tech companies found that women receive personality criticism that men do not. When women try and live up to the male bias standard, they are told to watch their tone and to step back and they are called bossy, abrasive, strident, aggressive, emotional, and irrational. The only word among this list that appeared in male reviews was aggressive. In addition, white men are rewarded at a higher rate than equally performing women and minoritized ethnicities. This may be why, for example, more than 40% of women leave tech companies after 10 years, compared to only 17% of men. If we look at the academic world where I work, uh, we see that female professors are accustomed to perform more unpaid work at work. For example, female professors are the ones students feel more comfortable turning to when they have problems, and they are asked to do more unvalued admin work because they fear that they're going to seem unlikable if they say no. Apparently, however, women are seen as unlikable no matter what they do, because an analysis of 14 million reviews on the website ratemyprofessor.com found that female professors are more likely to be described as mean, unfair, strict, and annoying. 
Mind you, this is despite the fact that students would rather turn to them when they want emotional or academic support. Meanwhile, male professors are more likely to be described as brilliant, intelligent, or smart. Right, let's move on to look at what happens when women do advance to the highest uh, positions in their field and smash the proverbial glass ceiling. Is everyone familiar with the idea of the glass ceiling? Yeah, yeah good. In a nutshell, uh, it means getting to the top position and what is often then expected of women is that they pave the way for other women and help them advance as well. However, this does not necessarily happen. This is called closing the glass ceiling behind you. Women do not always help other women. In fact, I have all too often heard the phrase, women are, their other's worst. Women are each other's worst enemies. Let's look at what is behind this phenomenon, and it is easily explained with a cultural theory called lateral hostility. Lateral violence is the better known sociological term for when minorities hit out at each other and oppress laterally, horizontally, as opposed to directing their anger towards the more privileged or the oppressor. Historically, this is seen in ethnic minorities' violence towards one another. More specifically, this was studied within the African-American population where peer murder was abundant. And this is seen when we think about the Black Lives Matter movement. It's a very new thing that the African-American community feels like they can talk about the police and point to their violence as opposed to lash out at each other. The idea within gendered lateral hostility is that women will establish hierarchies within their communities as men with better professional opportunities have actively withheld resources, pitting women against each other. In conclusion, lateral hostility is not women's inability to share resources with each other, but rather a reaction to having to fight and maintain incredibly hard-earned positions of power and influence. So, women are held back by two means. As we have seen, just getting to and existing at work is already a much more laborious task for women. But women are often punished just for being women. The same actions or even overperformance are seen as unpleasant in women simply because they are women. And what I want to leave you with is the thought that it is not enough to ask women how they feel they are disadvantaged, because women don't necessarily know this any better than their employers do. Women don't know that what makes their daily life hard is because the snow plow plowed the wrong road first. Right. So the machinery of normalization is so good at hiding the bias that really more thorough research is needed to uncover and unveil these inequalities. I think let's give Siri a huge round of applause. We, we have time for two, two questions, uh, if there's anyone in the audience who, who has one. Yeah, okay. Just make sure you speak into the mic so we can hear you. Thank you, Joey. So, please, could you just open it up a little bit more that women are, you know, just hated because they are women. Could you just speak more to that? Thank you. Thanks. So it's the idea that if we see the man, especially the white man, the white heterosexual middle class man as the normal person and the way that they react to and the way that they advance and the way that they see their career paths, et cetera, if we see that as normal, then by default, the woman becomes abnormal. So women's reactions to things, the way that women are, the way that they hold themselves is seen as abnormal. So when women act as women, that goes wrong because it's not something that we're used to. When women act as men, that goes wrong because women are not supposed to act like men. And the workplace is still a very sort of male-centered place in the sense that we do see women as the people who run the home and men as the breadwinner. So when women encroach on men's territory, they are by default in the wrong place. So when women, no matter what women do, it's seen as sort of off because they're in the wrong environment. Does that answer your question? Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> do, you, do you have a follow-up? 
All right, well, we'll go to the next question. The great thing about this is that Siri's staking around for networking, so you guys can grab each other. Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is if this is, um, I don't, to what extent it applies to women in the terms, in terms of, isn't it a bit of a generalization of, of women's experiences? And also, the explain, explaining women away, you know, that sort of, if you get what I mean, that if I don't succeed, there must be some structural problem. And I get there are plenty of structural problems, but I'm just saying in terms of women across the world, or is this a particularly Eurocentric perspective? What about the cases of nonprofits, for instance, where you find the majority of staff are female? Um, how far does this apply? That's a good question. I would say that this is um, from the global north and specifically white centered. My expertise does not go far enough, unfortunately, sort of outside of that. I would say that the question of whether we look at something in terms of is it statistical and structural versus are these individual cases is that we often, especially in Finland, we fall into the um, we get kind of blinded by the equality that we already have. We think that we live in already an equal country and therefore when something goes wrong with women's careers or if they don't advance, we think of them as individually failing. But then there are these bigger structural problems and we do not live in an equal society. And when we start to sort of unpack these, we notice that society is built by men and for men. So whether it's the size of your phone or the way that the snowplow goes or the medication that you eat that has only been tested by men, everything is rigged against women in their daily lives. And these are structural statistical problems. And I think that it's misguided to think of them as individual. All right, let's give uh, Siri a huge round of applause. <laughs> Siri is going to stick around for, for, for networking, so there is definitely an opportunity uh, to continue the conversation. So uh, let's, let's, keep this, let's keep this going. So individuals who receive mentorship are five times more likely uh, to be promoted than those who do not, underscoring the undeniable app uh, power of personal guidance and support in career growth. Our next talk is going to illuminate the ripple effect of mentorship and sponsorship, uh, revealing how these critical relationships not only empower individuals, but also, also foster a culture of growth, inclusion, and success across organizations. So to guide us through this is the community manager of Horizon, a nonprofit uh, diversifying tech through helping women and diverse talents getting hired in Finland. Uh, Vivi has a background in building global recruitment and HR in the software industry. So please help me give a huge round of applause to uh, Vivi, who's a community manager at Horizon. Thank you. That's for you. Awesome. I have a really bad track record with clickers, but let's see. Maybe I'll be able to make this work. And I just have to say, uh, just affirming Siri's message, we were having a chat earlier, not related to my presentation, but having a chat earlier. And I told her that I feel so lucky that I have a partner who splits the kind of like household chores and childcare with me pretty much even. And she raised the fact that, isn't it funny that you have to feel lucky about that? Look at that, like the biases, they're, they're, they're still here and, and they're against women. But anyways, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is the ripple effect of mentorship and sponsorship and actually focusing more on sponsorship. Um, and you'll find out in a sec why. So let's start with uh, what is a mentor versus what is a sponsor? So we are probably traditionally more familiar with uh, the term mentor. That's someone who can be from any organization, uh, so it doesn't have to be from the same organization as you. Um, they give career direction and advice. So they're like helping you with skills development and identifying opportunities in your field, um, giving you feedback and support that helps you kind of like build 
your career from like skills perspective. And they also can give you um, kind of networking opportunities within the like kind of peer networks. So that's pretty, pretty clear, right? Um, but then sponsors, and this is really funny because I really did fall deep into a research rabbit hole when I was prepping for this keynote. And sponsorship was actually a term that I never knew I needed so badly. So a sponsor is someone who doesn't have to be from the same organization. They're basically your ally in making you, your skills, your potential visible. Um, so they advocate for opportunities and promotions for you. They uh, are, and they have to be, in order to be a sponsor, they have to be from the higher levels of the organization and they have to have influence, like real influence in um, the decision-making processes. So these are kind of the differences that we can use as a starting point. So mentoring is really amazing because not only do you get to usually get to know someone who is already like one step ahead at your career and receive their insights and their guidance and kind of tr they can trace back their steps in their career. You can learn from that. They can give feedback on like the practical stuff that you do. Like if you are a web developer, for example, then they can give you tangible feedback on like how can you follow the best coding conventions or like um, share their knowledge of how they've done this before. And they can also, of course, as I said, they can help you expand peer networks. So usually people who are already uh, a little bit more advanced in their career know other people who do the same thing, right? And so they can give you access to that. And if they don't have an answer to something, they can help you sort of like troubleshoot in a larger group. And also modeling leadership. How are they leading their career? How, if they're a team leader, like they can share you the insights. But what I really, really wanted to focus on today is the sponsorship. And this is something that I think many people would understand as corporate politics. And the more deep I went into my research, the more I understood what's at play here. And this is also something that kind of isn't natural for women for multiple reasons, and it's not women's fault. Um, so sponsors, being uh, women on the higher levels of an organizational ladder and hierarchy, when we think about who is holding most of the leadership positions, so who can even qualify as a sponsor? Well, um, according to some, some research, and this is also very much Eurocentric to uh, note, um, around... Um, 30% or 33%, so like a solid third is, uh, of leadership positions is held by women. And the rest by men. So men are still greatly overrepresented in leadership positions. So most potential sponsors are men. Okay. And then um, there are some funny things that are going on with this. Um, biases and like kind of structural and um, kind of these like mindset issues that prevent men from sponsoring women. Because we have less women to sponsor other women than we have men that could also sponsor women, right? But then there are things like affinity bias, which drives us to um, kind of support people uh, that look like us. It's called also like me bias. And of course, if you're a guy, like, for example, middle-aged, uh, white, hetero guy, then you're probably more likely to see yourself in another person who looks like you. And then you might start sponsoring someone like you, right? And that's probably not a woman, especially not a woman of color. So that's kind of a structural issue. And then, of course, there are also these kind of attitudes and, like, misconceptions about uh, relationships where there is a man in a higher position and a woman in a lower position, right? Oh my goodness, she's sleeping her way to the top. Oof, like you want to avoid that, right? So there are some barriers 
for us to extend because I know like the topic today is like women on the global talent arena. So that's why, the, uh, why I'm talking about the issues of this uh, as well, because if there's someone, maybe a guy in the audience who is uh, on the higher levels of their organization, then you can be deliberate and very open about sponsoring someone that might be a woman, uh, a younger woman, a more junior woman, and be very open about the fact that, hey, I am sponsoring this person because I believe in their potential and I want to see them succeed. Yeah, so um, I know I went a little bit off track from this uh, slide. I made it yesterday uh, and then I kept on researching because like such an interesting topic. But sponsoring is where the actual value comes to play. So statistically, according to some research, I cannot comment for the entire global um, stats, but statistically, women are actually more sponsored, uh, not sponsored, more mentored than, uh, than men. So women receive more mentoring than men, but less, way less sponsoring than men. And some of the reasons are what I just mentioned, these like misconceptions about these relationships, affinity bias, and uh, maybe even lack of just like formal sponsoring um, structures. Some multinational companies do have formal programs and then it's a little bit easier, right? Because everyone knows what's going on and it doesn't feel like dirty corporate politics. Also, women tend to think that they should be recognized for their own achievements. So women believe in meritocracy, but with sponsorship being a thing and corporate politics, which kind of like overlaps with sponsorship, at least in the minds of women, according to some sources, it makes really difficult for women to participate and go out and find sponsors for themselves because they see that it's not fair. It's not fair. I want to be recognized for my efforts and like what I've made happen. So it's, it's tough, right? Um, but yeah, but this is where the actual like promotions happen. And sometimes mentoring relationships can be at the same time sponsoring relationships. So they're not mutually exclusive. But I think um, it's worth for more companies to formalize sponsoring so that it is clear that these are the individuals that we want to see succeed and also make it visible that we support women. We are leveling the playing field. Yeah, because this is, this is someone with actual decision-making power really vouching for you. And this is where we see like, actual like, career progression happen, even to the like, highest levels. So both are good, but I would think that Together, they're even better. Because one of the um, things preventing people from sponsoring kind of rising stars is that they don't know people who don't look like them. So then, how are you going to put your reputation on the line for someone you don't know and you don't trust, right? So that's why I would propose that um, we start with the mentoring, because it's like a lower threshold start. And then you get, get to gradually know your mentee and you can then authentically vouch for them and for their career progression and for their success in the company. Thank you so much. All right, let's give Vivi a huge round of applause. Okay, I have time for one question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I took so long. No, 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 this is your, I want to, I'm a stickler for time. Is there anyone in the audience who has, yes, okay. Thank you, wonderful talk. I have like a comment more than a question. Sure. You mentioned formalization yeah. of the sponsorship mm -hmm. and it really resonated with me mm -hmm. because it's not just the sponsor and the person who is being sponsored, but it's this whole environment. Mm. Because there is, as in the previous talk, there is the default, how the environment works. Yeah. And if it's not formalized, then it's gonna, it might play against the yeah. duo. So thank you for that. 
Thank you so much. That's a really great comment, and I and I fully. I mean, obviously, I made made the claim, but 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 the thing is that it really does help with people, to, like for women to participate, because otherwise they might exclude themselves from finding a sponsor because they don't feel like it's fair when men statistically are already doing it on their own accord. Awesome. Oh. Like I mentioned, Vivi is also going to stay around for uh, cocktail. So uh, now's the time for the panel. We're feeling okay? We're still in it with me? Oh, gosh, I can't lose you yet. We still have 30 minutes of panel to discuss. All right, let's take a, let's take a, are we all here together? Yeah. All right, come on. Keep the energy up. All right. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and intro uh, our panelists. So our, our first panelist uh, is an international uh, coaching federation accredited coach. Uh, she works with individuals in uh, finance, banking, law, tech, uh, and she also trains and challenges teams to grow their leadership skills with a special focus on influencing skills, inclusive leadership, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, Emma brings a wide-ranging international experience from 19 years as a lawyer in London uh, and in tech, including as the head of legal at Google UK in Ireland. Uh, please welcome to the stage uh, Emma Jelly, who's the founder of... Uh, our, uh, Come, come upstairs. <laughs> we had founder on the <laughs> of Jellyworks. We had founder the, the insider information. We had founder written there, and then we changed it last moment. Okay, our next panelist uh, works as a sustainability manager at Deloitte uh, and is an active volunteer at Women's Bank and other initiatives uh, related to supporting women's work in education. Uh, she is a certified uh, expert in financial inclusion policies and sustainable finance. Uh, she. She focuses on a variety of sustainability matters in her professional work, one of them being social and human rights aspects, focusing on financial literacy and inclusion. Uh, she has more than nine years of experience from the financial sector, supporting diverse stakeholders and individuals with their financial literacy, and supporting financial inclusion in the global south. Uh, please welcome to the stage Ida, who's a sustainability manager at Deloitte. Okay, and lastly, I uh, invite an associate professor, professor of organizational psychology at BI Norwegian School of Business, uh, interested in bridging gaps between academia and practice and utilizing academic knowledge in the service of society. Her research lies at the intersection of people, management, organizations, and society. Uh, she is an advocate of uh, women and other minority groups' rights and has collaborated on several projects to advance workplace inclusion. Uh, she is one of the lead researchers on the Support and Accelerate Workplace Inclusion Project, where she plays an active role in advancing gender-inclusive employer policies and women economic participation across the Arab Middle East and the North African region. Uh, so please welcome Lena uh, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. And now that we got the, the bios out of, out of the way, I'm going to kind of go directly into uh, our chat. I'm going to take my cell phone out of my pocket. So uh, I mentioned this at the offset of the evening, and I, I really want to focus our conversation on three key points. So inclusive uh, workplace policies, financial literacy, and managing significant career transitions. So in the sake of time, uh, I'm just going to kind of jump uh, right in. Uh, to this. So, uh, Lena, for, for, for you first. I think that I mentioned this at every single hired event, uh, that there is enough evidence and studies that show inclusive workplace policies not only benefit minority groups, but also contribute to the overall growth of organizations, both monetarily and with respect to innovation. Uh, so as someone who is so deeply involved uh, in advancing workplace inclusion and gender-inclusive uh, employer policies, how can companies effectively craft and implement policies that truly support women's advancement and participation in the workplace, particularly in regions with deep-rooted cultural gender norms? Great. Thank you for the question. There's so many parts to it. Let's see where we're going to start tackling this. Um, okay. So I think maybe the first point, I'm, I'm going to draw on my work on the SAWI project. Um, so SAWI, it, 
it's an acronym for uh, support and accelerate women inclusion or workplace inclusion, but it actually also means in Arabic to equate. So the whole idea of the Sawi project was around, around that. So I'm going to draw on, on the Sawi project that we did in the Middle East and North Africa, and we still continue to do, but also I'm going to bring it closer to home and to our conversation here with this um, um, international group of people in the Nordics, in uh, Finland in particular. So maybe the first lesson that I could reflect on from based on our work is that organizations can play a huge role. Um, particularly in contexts where you have, if, if I'm gonna, if I want to describe it in that way, maybe weak governance, I'm gonna use that term, um, weak governance in terms of either laws exist to protect equality, but they're not really monitored, they're not really implemented. Oh. I slipped and hurt my neck a few days ago on the ice, so I shouldn't turn. Um, so sometimes laws exist, uh, but uh, are not, they, they are not really followed, so organizations can play a big role here. But sometimes there's a gap at the national level in terms of protective legislation. Specifically, I'm going to give you the example of the anti-sexual harassment legislation in Lebanon that was only passed in 2020. But before that, for 10 years, on one hand, we were working on pushing for that legislation to be in place. But in parallel, what we did is that we started identifying organizations that play a big role in the uh, um, economic landscape and are big employers and started working with them on implementing policies that protect against sexual harassment and discrimination and other type of bullying behavior. So the idea here is that in the absence of legislation, you can use these policies in the court of law even. So organizations are not side players that you know, only receive what's happening from, you know, are, are they told by uh, the government what they need to do. They can actually actively create uh, and change the environment that we exist within. So that's on one hand. So second point, if, if I want to go closer to, uh, I'm looking at you peripherally, so it's okay. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you want to think about what kind of legislations should organizations implement, and I know many of you uh, uh, are familiar with these, I'm gonna talk about groups of policies rather than specific ones. Um, first, we need policies for attracting the right, uh, um, an inclusive and, and a diverse pool of individuals into the organization. So policies that have to do with fair recruitment, fair um, um, selection practices, and we can delve into that perhaps afterwards uh, uh, if anyone has questions about these. There's another set of selection, you know, uh, uh, policies that could be around the fair promotion, your life through the organizational hierarchy and moving up and making sure that employees have an equal right to growth and development opportunities and mentorship opportunities and all other activities that help you move up the ranks. There's another set around flexible pay, uh, flexible working, uh, uh, of course, equal pay, etc. but things that have to do with you as an individual, as a family member, as a, as a parent, as a, someone who decided not to have children. Everyone has the right to have uh, policies and benefits that are catered to them. So there's a whole bunch of uh, equal benefits and inclusive benefits uh, uh, policies that could be there. But the last bunch that for me is extremely important is the one that has to do with creating an inclusive work environment, an environment that is safe, safe from bullying, safe from harassment, safe from sexual harassment, and all other types of uh, um, sources of discomfort that make us uncomfortable in our skin. When it comes to these legislations, or, or policies in particular, um, it's not only important to craft the right policies, what is more important is what happens in case of violation. How does the employee in your organization feel, and what protective mechanisms did you provide them so that they could go back and push back, and, or maybe not necessarily push back, even say that this violation occurred and happened to them? So this is the most important, it's the practice of the implementation of these policies is even more important than the policy itself and what the policy says. Now the last point I want to mention is I want to bring all of this back to here. Nowhere on this planet is safe. 
No one should feel that now, oh, I'm from the Nordics, we, have, we are haven for gender equality, let's relax, we, this doesn't concern us, we have policies, etc. No, and for many reasons, I'm going to highlight two of them. One is um, a very interesting report that I read recently by the um, Council of, uh, Nordic Council of Ministers. It's available publicly online, you could just search it. At the time, it was the, the uh, Minister of, of Iceland who was chairing the council, and uh, she was leading the drafting of the report. And the interesting thing, interesting, negatively interesting, but interesting uh, point that I found there was um, a study that they conducted across Europe, 28 countries, collected data from more than 48,000 roughly uh, women about uh, sexual harassment experiences of women, lived experiences. And um, to my surprise, Finland was among the top in that uh, report. There was very high levels uh, of reported sexual harassment at work, women reporting that they have experienced it in the past year. Of course, one possible explanation is that um, you know, women are more likely to, they're more empowered, they're more likely to report. Okay, fair enough. But they are reporting, they are experiencing this. The reality is there. And then I delve deeper to understand like, so who are these women who are facing that problem? And it turns out it's the highly educated and higher level positions who are facing the most discrimination, sexual harassment in particular, not discrimination. Why? In, the, in, a, in a place and in a country and in a world where you are, women are an equal number, you know, we, con, we are considered majority in the workplace, particularly women, we notice that as you move upward in the organizational hierarchy, you become the minority. So you are in a place where you are less protected, you are more prone to uh, uh, such intimidations and such advances, unwanted advances. The other uh, um, point why none of us is safe and no one should relax at any point in time uh, is because of the far right movement that we're seeing across the globe. There's the revenge of the patriarchs. Now people are finding an opportunity like, yes, it's a golden time, let's go back and reverse. And agendas are being pushed back. Anti-woke movement is the thing. <laughs> it's a term, I'm not mentioning it now for the first time. You've read it, you've heard about it. Uh, we all know experiences and specific examples where agendas have been pushed back. In the US, one of the biggest economies, strongest economies in the world, women can't have an abortion, cannot choose, don't have choices over their own bodies. Now is not the time to relax. Even if we achieve high levels and we get to a level of gender parity and gender equality, the, it's always important for us not to forget that those protective mechanisms need to be in place and we need to work collectively on them. If I can conclude, with, with one point, every single one of us can play a role. Individuals, organizations, governments. It's not one person's job and it's not one entity's job. It's a multi-stakeholder problem and, a multi and the solution is also driven by multi-stakeholder uh, uh, involvement. Well, I have some I have some other questions about uh, what types of policies you, you were mentioning and also how those should be measured. But I, I want to look at uh, sustainability and effective leadership, right? Uh, these are crucial elements in, in inclusive workplace policies, uh, impacting everything from employee engagement to corporate reputation. Really, so in you know, Ida and and um, Emma, in your respective areas of sustainability and leadership coaching, how do you perceive the role of an uh, inclusive workplace policy in achieving goals as such as nurturing inclusive leadership? And what examples can you can you share with that? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the role of policies. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I, yeah, the, the role of, of having how how can we how do we perceive inclusive workplace policies as achieving sustainability goals and nurturing inclusive leadership or in, inclusive leaders? Shall I? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so, particularly in larger organisations, there are of course KPIs around inclusion and policies and practices that back those up. Um, and yet, we need to have the receiver and the actor that makes those policies, policies have life. So if you are a person of privilege and power, do you care to implement that policy? 
And that's something I've pondered when working on inclusive <laughs> leadership interventions. But what is it that can motivate someone who might not actually be suffering as the minority to open their heart and mind and action to maybe let go of some of that power? And, and that's, that's quite a conundrum. Um, and I think it goes beyond the workplace. I think it's a whole person matter. I think it's about how a person conceives of themselves in the world and how they see their neighbour <clears throat> and how they see the future that they want to be a part of. Uh, it, the thing that might motivate them to enact something in a workplace policy might actually be their family relations or what their daughter has gone through, or what they're seeing their wife live. Um, and so I think, the, what can I say? I think if workplaces can encourage whole person living and really to embrace people's whole life living, that is useful also for the organization. Anita? Yeah, and if I take a different point of view from the EU regulatory perspective, that there are now these uh, corporate sustainability reporting directive, which is coming to an effect in 2025 for, uh, well, it used to be a reporting directive for 11,000, and now it's 50 thousand companies within Europe. So there are some push from the regulatory point of view, but of course that shouldn't be the only driver. The driver should come from the entity and from the company. And if we think about attracting workforce, thinking about the future workforce, what, what they value, you really need to think this. And also the wide stakeholders of different entities, they have demands, needs, they address different things. And if you don't have anything, I mean, who, who wants to work with you? Yeah, and let's look at these policies that are that are in place, right? So uh, gender inclusive sure. policies, policies that nurture leadership. How should organizations measure their success? Are you looking at me? I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you. Um, you know, the, the measurement part is an extremely important part. Um, it's one thing to put a policies in place, but then are they being used? Are they people? Are people reporting? Are uh, what are the numbers and the follow up? This is what matters at the end of the day. The reason why we put the policies is to create inclusive environment. If we stop at putting the policies, it's like we haven't done anything because we might be solving something that is not the problem. We might be putting policies in a place where, I don't know, the organizational culture doesn't allow people to report. Uh, people don't feel safe doing that. So monitoring the numbers, whether it's sentiments, what do people think, what do people feel, what do people believe, is very important. But also in terms of specific numbers of hiring, what is the purpose of this, let's say, recruitment policy, is to make sure that we have uh, uh, fair recruitment practices. Great. What are, who is applying to my organization? Am I able to attract people from the different walks of life? Did the numbers change over time? Am I able to target groups of people that I was not able to target before? All of these, you know, we think together, sit together and think about what is the purpose of this? We can always come up with a KPI to measure and to look back and see whether it was uh, uh, the right thing or not. Yeah. So I want to shift now away from this into financial literacy and independence. Um, research indicates that women often face significant barriers to financial independence, including gaps in financial literacy. Uh, the disparity can impact their ability to make informed uh, financial decisions and achieve uh, economic autonomy. So my question is for you, Ida. Uh, what strategies do you believe are most effective in bridging these gaps for women? Uh, especially in the context of supporting diverse stakeholders and individuals in both developed and uh, developing uh, economies? Yeah, a great question. And financial literacy is, of course, important for everyone. But we see these uh, gender gaps that we do have, gender pay gap, gender employment gap, gender gap in leadership positions, but also the gender financial literacy gap. And financial literacy is indeed what you mentioned um, making informed financial decisions and understanding your opportunities as well. But if we take first a bit of a broader view to it, uh, you mentioned in developed and developing, so uh, 
it's about the bigger matter, so women's uh, economic inclusive uh, inclusiveness. And currently we have more than 700 women, 700 million women in all around the globe without a bank account. We do have climate crisis ongoing where we need resiliency. If you are staying, working, living in a geographical area that has high climate risk, for example, we have these our weather patterns are changing, uh, it comes to resiliency and savings and insurance. If you don't have any, what's the backup then? So that's kind of the, the broader we are if, if we come come then to the, let's say, the EU level. We do have a lot of EU research on why uh, women don't have the knowledge of making those informed financial decisions versus men. We also lack the confidence of making those decisions. And I think that's where we have to think that, okay, whose responsibility this is, why this is, what are the barriers there? And I think, of course, a few two important items are education and collaboration. And if we think ourselves in individuals in different contexts, that of course we have uh, our households, we have our savings, investments, insurance, mortgages, credit cards, retirement planning, all of this, and understanding the interest rates, understanding the interest gaps, if we have some, and all of those, then we are individuals in as an employees. And we do have benefits that our companies are providing. So maybe call options, share options, uh, pension schemes, personal funds, all of this. And then there might be, a, we are individual or we are entrepreneur, uh, we own a company and we do have the financials of the company. Or if we're a startup, we have the fundraising, that how we are getting capital to make invest, investments or uh, investing or then operating. So we are individual in many contexts and it's quite complex landscape, to be honest, to be in and tackling all of that. So I think it needs education, collaboration, and it's very often thrown to the individual that it's your responsibility to understand your financials, to understand being independent. Um, but is it really? I think it comes then to the collaboration that their government, they make policies, uh, education in Finland, schools, universities. We have great opportunity to start early with it. Um, then companies, of course, uh, they can provide you different financial literacy uh, trainings, financial well-being trainings, and how, how being, if we think about well-being at work, it's also financial well-being, and it cannot be excluded. So I think what we can do, all everyone as an individual, is to discuss raise these questions in the different context we are operating and acting and um, discuss with the others, uh, but also to open a broader dialogue within the companies, within the startup world, within wherever we are in, in the universities. So I think that's our responsibility to talk about these things and that's what we everyone can do. But then, of course, it, it's need a larger cooperation, let's say, to to bridge these gaps. You, you've met, you mentioned education quite a bit there, yep. right? And this STEM program is also a huge, a huge talking point when we look at um, uh, literacy across you know, many, many topics. But what are some educational tools or programs that you would recommend to empower those looking to learn more about financial literacy necessary for financial independence? Yeah. Well, if we th there are a lot of countries having these financial inclusion uh, policies and programs, and again, coming to an education, that education programs that are targeting women, targeting elderly women, targeting girls, or then SMEs or entrepreneurs, and kind of taking into consideration in their and our individual needs as a woman. So that's one, but in Finland, we do have a financial literacy center 
And we do have a strategy in Finland to enhance the financial inclusion, financial literacy, and to be the top country in the world by 2030 in, in terms of financial literacy. That strategy, it involves a lot of parties around NGOs, association, corporates, and I think it really needs also this public-private um, collaboration. But I really hope that this initiative will bridge these gaps. Uh, they promise at least to be innovative and they really highlight the innovativeness in the ways. Uh, they promise website, courses, apps, all of this. Uh, but it's remained to be seen. Only thing I'm kind of lacking in this strategy and initiative for Finland is that it doesn't really consider women uh, as, a, as a minority group or other minority groups and their unique needs. It's overall for everyone and it's, it's good, but it should be considered. Um, but coming to that, I there's not one I can name. Of course, there are a lot of podcasts, a lot of blogs, social media uh, that are good to start with. But I think you can also just start the conversations within your own context. And if you don't know anyone to talk about this, because it's still a bit of taboo to talk about your financials. So you can reach out to me and I can discuss with you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get uh, Emma and Lena into the conversation here. Uh, because we, we've chosen this as one of the pivotal roles uh, for the advancement uh, of, of women in, in this scape, how do you see the role of financial literacy in supporting women's career growth uh, and leadership opportunities, knowing that financial independence is closely linked to, to these opportunities? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think that the more financially independent you are, the more courageous you are. So you might take that risk, you might go and join that, ditch your well-paid big corporate job and go and join a startup. You might do that if you know you've, sort, you've sorted out your finance, you've got a buffer. Um, or you might decide to courageously speak up against a non-implemented inclusive policy at work. You might choose to say... I. I don't appreciate how you just placed your hand on my knee at this offsite. It's making me uncomfortable. I'd like you to remove it and never do that again. You might say that if your finances are sorted out mm. because you know that if it turns around, bites you in the butt, you can still be okay. So I think financial <laughs> independence and courage are quite closely linked. That's a great point. Exactly. Like, so if there's a policy for anti-sexual harassment, but you're financially uh, in a weaker position, you are much less likely to go and report because of fear of repercussions. I love this idea. And I love the idea of the, the, the focus on the financial well-being. You know, as a psychologist, I focus on the psychological well-being, but the financial well-being is equally important. Um, I do multi-level statistical analysis, etc. but when it comes to finance, it was never my forte, like, I, I never received formal education uh, uh, into that. And uh, you were asking about apps, and I, um, I, I used something called Female Invest. I attended one of their webinars. I didn't use the app. I'm not sure if it's good or not, but it's particularly for women in improving literacy. And after watching the webinar for like 10 minutes, you know, now it was like half an hour maybe, I went and I changed a practice and how I invest through my uh, uh, mobile phone, actually. And I thought it was extremely important. I felt empowered that I know now something more about, rather than randomly going through my OP app and choosing whatever investment to do, uh, you know, at least I had a little bit of knowledge and, and I, we so need that, it's very important. Um, but I wanted to mention something. How is it important for the progression uh, for women you know, in the future? There's a statistic that really bothers me from, uh, from Norway and Norway, because that's where I work. Um, it's, uh, the statistic was that 24% 20, uh, 20, of women pensioners earn the minimum pension wage compared to 4% of uh, um, men pensioners. Okay, so this percentage is really disturbing. Like, okay, obviously they were doing jobs where they earned less money, etc. But then. Does this have to determine all your life? If I, you're going to talk about career transitions in, uh, in, in a little bit. If I went to spend time with my kids and went back, am I doomed for the rest of my life uh, for not being able to make more money? So there are ways learning and, and financial literacy, particularly around investing and how to make more out of your money is something that could help bridge this gap and can decrease this discrepancy 
in, in, in those percentages. And I think indeed that that's one point. If you have long career breaks, how that impacts to your pension. I mean, it, pension is a long way, hopefully, but it impacts. And I know my former colleague from Germany, she was in a maternity leave and she looked for a daycare place for her child over a year. And she wanted to come back to work, but she couldn't. So one year plus, perhaps another one year, that's, uh, that's a break. And women just live longer statistically, so we have longer pension <laughs> periods. Well, that, that's a great segue. Thank you for setting that up for me. <laughs> the next, <laughs> the next portion that we want to talk about is managing significant career transitions. <laughs> uh, we know career transitions, whether by choice or circumstance, can be pivotal moments in the an individual's professional journey. Uh, for women, these transitions can often come with unique challenges and opportunities, right? Finding uh, daycare, uh, taking care of loved ones who, who are ill. So, uh, Emma, from your perspective as a coach specializing in leadership skills and diversity, what are the key considerations and support systems that women should seek out to navigate significant career transitions successfully? Uh, and then, and then after that, I would like to know, like, how can they leverage these uh, transitions to advance their career uh, and leadership potential? Okay, I will address that, and I feel the need to <laughs> offload one thought that I'm having. We've heard a lot of negative stuff that impacts women, and I'm noticing a sense of hopelessness and sadness in myself. And I'm wondering if anyone else is feeling this. And I know I need a sense of hope right now. And I would, I would like to just raise the thought that no one needs to be a victim, that we can sensitively and intelligently notice and know that there are systemic issues and we don't need to fall under them. Change happens one individual at a time. And we can be compassionate for our fellow women and, and understand these systemic issues without then thinking that is a law that has to dictate my experience because it does not need to be so. We can be agents for change and we can decide for ourselves what thoughts we let in. You know, am I going to accept that I'm now going to suffer? I'm having a child, it's gonna have a negative impact for me. That's one way you could view it, but play with other thoughts, maybe something that's more liberating to you. Maybe even think about, instead of women, think about traditionally feminine qualities. What can I do to embrace traditionally feminine qualities in myself and around me? And that, so that's also for the men in the audience. And, and that we can notice, you know, in the leadership space, there's more and more talk, for example, about empathy and compassion and humility, which are often traditionally associated with femininity. Well, this is coming up. Let's not, let's not be hopeless. This is a change that's a positive one. And as for when you're approaching a transition, well, I'm going to channel my former lawyer who loves a good definition. So here goes, folks. <laughs> so uh, Nancy Schlossberg, she's, a, she's an educational professor now in retirement, rocking woman. And she says, a transition is any event or non-event that results in changed relationships routines, assumptions, and roles. So any event or non-event that results in changed relationships, routines, assumptions, and roles. And it's perception that matters. So you can't point to any person and say, you're experiencing a transition. They have to feel it and know it themselves. So if we're thinking about a woman going through work, there might be they might be going through a transition without any child in sight. They might be starting, as might a man, starting to question the importance of their work. Or they might be starting to think about meaning in what they're doing. So let's be sensitive to the fact that transition can be happening around us unseen and unnamed. We can also admit that having a child is likely to trigger big thoughts. And so your question is, what support systems are there and what can be done? Um, 
And of course, we've mentioned speaking to peers, um, the importance of that and the usefulness of that. There are plenty of books that we can read about transition. You can tap into networks, mothers in business, and so on. And you can grow in your own self-awareness. And I'm going to just pull out one possible uh, tool, which is maternity coaching, if we're going to focus on parenting or parental coaching. It's a thing. Some companies are even investing in this thing. So what is this thing? Well, it might be delivered up and served as follows. A session before you go on maternity leave, a session while, and a session after. Now, why might this be useful? It can be a place to sit with a coach, which I would call a thought partner. That's what I do. I think with people about meaning all things to help them have insights in their stuff. That's what a coach is. And so before going on maternity leave, it can be useful to sit with someone who will really help you think through, what am I going through emotionally, practically? Um, what should I prepare for? And then check in on that during your leave and then check in after. Now, in my experience, and I'm here, I'm drawing on my experience, not only from coaching, but living in the corporate world and having plenty of friends and contacts who've been th through these, and I'm a parent myself. Um, it can be really useful, practically speaking, before you go through, through this transition to think about your strengths. What is it that you're really, really good at? And make a note of it. There will be a time during a transition when you will start to doubt yourself, when your courage will be rocked. And it can be good to have something to go back to and remember, this is who I am. These are my strengths. And it can be useful in a corporate environment to think about your networks. Do a stakeholder map before you go. Who has power and influence and interest in my work? Who are they? What's my plan for communicating with them, perhaps even during my absence and certainly when I get back? Because when you go on this parental gap, you're likely to check out to a certain degree and maybe even forget all that stuff. You've got other things to think about. So it can be useful to have that document when you come back and think, OK, who's changed on this map? Who do I need to check in with them? What's, how is our relationship going to be new or different? Do I need in some way to help them manage the transition that my change has created. And so these are some sort of practical things we can do. And I think it's useful to also name the likely presence of fear. So, and actually well-grounded fear that it can happen that you go on a long leave and your projects are uh, subsumed by someone else. What's your plan? Do you want to get them back when you come back? Who knows that you want to get them back? Do the appropriate stakeholders know that? What's your plan when you return if you're not voluntarily given them back? So to think things through with your coach can be a useful, or your peer, your thoughtful friend, to think through that. Um, yeah, and to not feel alone. And what, what, what can be done on an organizational level to better support this sort of transition? I open this uh, to, to, to the rest of the panelists here. Uh, how, how can organizations better support uh, individuals who are transitioning? Well, go ahead. what comes to my mind is we talk about mentorship, we talk about sponsorship earlier, and also all of these leadership programs that can be there. That, and, but I think there can be a lot of programs and coaching parental for re preparing you for your retirement, but just to find the right people that are there for you and who you want to sponsor you or encourage you, um, challenge you as well to have that. Uh, and if the organization kind of uh, enhances that kind of a culture, I think that gives a, gives a lot of foundation to it. So yeah, th these are great ideas. These are things, practical things that organizations can do in terms of like coaching and mentorship. I think maybe one thing that could be done is, the, is increased flexibility in the mindset. Because transitions, you know, we're talking about parental transition, but transition could be anything really. And how many of you here today would like, you know, have, con have considered or have actually changed their careers? <laughs> 
Um, you know, it, we live one life. We're not no longer in this old era where a career is something that we do. We're, you know, tied to this organization. We show loyalty by staying and moving up the ranks in a, in a hierarchical way. Things are changing. The world is changing. The way we do things is changing. And some jobs that exist today in five years' time, they're going to be canceled. They won't exist anymore. And for me, it's relevant as an academic because sometimes I advise students what you want to study, etc. And I tell them that you're studying this with the idea that you will go down, you will do this job in the future, but this job might not even exist. So the flexibility of knowing that careers are not one solid thing that is unchangeable and that a person can go, th go through their uh, career trajectory in a non-linear way is very important. And I think having the right mindset will help you think about strategies of what you need to do. I have last, one last question before we open it to the audience. Uh, and this is from the World Economic Forum's 2023 Global Gender, Gender Gap Report. I try saying that three times in a row. Uh, it emphasizes the slow pace toward achieving uh, gender parity, uh, pre uh, predicting that it's going to take another 131 years at the current rate in which it's happening right now. <laughs> However, good news, <laughs> Finland uh, ranks third globally uh, with a score indicating that it's closed the gap at about 86% um, on, on this report in 2023. So uh, the only two other uh, nations ahead of that in, in Europe. So quickly, uh, just so that we can open this to the audience, uh, what do we think if, if there's one sort of idea here that would help close the gap locally uh, more rapidly. Close the gap here in Finland. Yeah, yeah, in Finland. Yeah, since we're since we're third and we're about eighty six percent of the gap has been reached, where do we? How do we fill in that other fourteen uh, percent? Uh, it's so much easier to tell you how to close the gap in a country where the gap is huge <laughs> than okay. when the gap is very narrow. <laughs> so I don't know, do you have like a, a quick fix for this problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah, should we, yeah, should we yeah. sort it out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, remuneration for leadership to enhance this in, uh, in so workplaces, so remuneration. Like it's tied to their companies, KPIs and, and targets to really push this. Just one idea. Uh, if I see it as a global problem, I think countries such as like Nordics in general, particularly like Finland, should be the norm teaching and, and promoting how this should be done. It's not, it's not to say that the world is perfect and we have closed the gender gap. But remember, my first advice is never stop. Where, where no one relax and you know take their shoes off because we're not going to stop. But But this should be the standard rather than other countries that I'm not going to name uh, leading the way in, in teaching the, you know, how to close the gender gap where actually, in fact, their gender gap needs many, many years to, uh, uh, to close. I've got an idea. I think um, considering, reconsider, if we could, as a society, reconsider what is valuable work. Uh, so, for example, in a professional services context, uh, the billable hour and serving your client is seen as valuable work. But there are uh, more progressive services, <laughs> professional services firms that are changing their remuneration systems to recognize the value of other types of work as well that might, for example, contribute to the psychological safety of the organization or the well-being of people, and to actually recognize that and pay for that. Mm. And I, I would like to attribute this idea to someone who's actually in this audience. Uh, we were talking at lunchtime. <laughs> if can I add one more can. thing? Yeah, because she inspired me. Emma always <laughs> inspires. You have a conversation with her. You, you go in with one conversation, you leave with like 17 thoughts on your mind. Um, I remembered uh, something that I wrote a couple of years back, uh, the, the concept of the care economy and shifting more towards the care economy. And this is recognizing things that we too don't recognize today, particularly care work. Care, we need it from the minute we are born till we are elderly. You know, it, it's something that throughout our lifetime is very important. However, if you think about it, what are the least paid jobs? Healthcare, elderly care, you know, uh, uh, daycare, everything that has to do with caring for the young and the adult and the, and the sick and the more vulnerable is under, undervalued. So I think if we start shifting together and, and reprioritizing economically what is important, we can, we can have a chance at really bridging this gap. 
And I think one one more thing, what we need to do, what Siri <laughs> mentioned, that women do eight hours, was it? Invisible work per week compared to men. So if we can start <laughs> decreasing <laughs> lower, lower that. that number. Yeah. Uh, okay, hey, we have time. I, want, I know that a huge portion of uh, what is really important at... Um, Epicenter events is the networking. Uh, and also, there's food that happens too, right? So I want to make sure that we have time for that. But I know that there have to be a few burning questions from, from our audience. So if there, if there is, we have time for about one or two uh, right here in, in the front. I just wait till you get the microphone so we can all hear you. Oh, OK. Uh, Thank you very much. That was quite interesting. My name is Natalia, and I'm a startup entrepreneur. And I have a feeling that what I'm doing now is very close to this theme. Uh, the question, because we're trying to empower communication in the workplace and make people uh, to build the horizontal tires and to communicate and to make some value-based recognition. So it will probably can be an option to move on with the question we are discussing today. Uh, my question is, uh, I arrived in Finland just a uh, year and a half ago, and I see the society is transparent. Everything is very, very clear for me. Uh, is it the same in workplace? Because when we uh, work uh, with this team, team, we see that it's in corporation. There is not so clear. There is not so transparent. And my hypothesis that uh, being on the workplace, people might have more pressure, more feel under pressure than is in their normal life. Or I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe it's quite clear. Thank you. Please could you say the question like, like that? So is it any it. difference between um, the feeling in society, the transparency mm -hmm. and clearness of the rules and in the workplace, in atmosphere of corporate life. So you're contrasting transparency in society versus yeah. in the corporate lack yes. of difference. At Depends. The corporate level. Yeah. She's saying the lack of at the corporate level. She's mm. seeing that there's mm. not. I see a different. Mm. I, I do feel it. I have mm. this feeling. I'm, I can't be sure. So my question is, is if it's any researchers, because there I'm a sociologist, specific. but I did not quite close to this matter. A specific topic or overall? Uh, I can say something about that. Um, when it comes to, to this clarity, you are right. Finland is one of those uh, uh, cultures that, uh, when it comes to communication, we refer to as low context. Uh, uh, cultures where you don't need many contextual cues. What I say is well, what I said that, I mean that. Whereas where I come from, ooh, high context culture, like you say something and then you have to read between the lines, above the line, under the line, like and think about what's happening here, who's that person, and, and put lots of interpretation. So there's room for lots of problems. But what you're pointing out here is this difference between those individuals who are low context, they say what they mean, and then when it comes to work, mm, things are not the same. Well, the power of organizational politics. Because even though you might be clear, there's it, within organizations, you might have competing priorities, you might have differences in views, you might have a certain agenda you want to advance. So this comes in, in the way, and it doesn't necessarily change who you are in terms of your communication, but it will be a variable that you need to consider when you are at work. Whereas if I'm sitting with you, you know, as a friend and we're talking, what, I, you, know, what you hear is, what I'm saying is, is really what I mean. But at work, hidden agendas, it's, it's not something that is culturally defined. Organizational agendas and politics is a thing that does exist. Thank you. Uh, one, one more quick question, if we have one in the audience. I would like to hear your opinion um, because we talked about leadership and decision making, there is a directive on quota on board members in public organizations, which is not yet met. I would just be curious about your opinion on the quota and should we reach it? Should there be persecutions and not? Yeah, just your opinion. I mean, we should definitely reach it and enhance it. In board, but also in the leadership groups. 
the diversity. I really want to hear what you think about this. <laughs> <laughs> because we talk about this yeah, a bit. Yeah, we did a bit. Yeah. Kota gives me this like this energy, you know, I have a love-hate relationship yeah. towards this concept. On one hand, without quotas, how can you push forward a change and make sure that it's going to happen? You know, when I put the quota, it's a target that you need to meet. But, you know, there's a dark side to quotas. Because the dark side is, you know, tokenism is when people start being hired because, oh, I'm the female hire on the board. You know, and then no one takes me seriously, no one wants to, uh, to appreciate. So, so there is a good and bad. But I think quotas is a great uh, first step in a change process when it comes to advancing, um, advancing representation in the workplace and on boards in particular. But it shouldn't be the end product. It should be something that eventually we are working towards getting rid of because of all the downside that it can have. Yeah, like a temporary... Yeah, necessary evil. I think we need that kind of things now, even in corporates, that you have these targets or KPIs that you have to have women in the leadership positions. But it's like discussed a temporary solution. But we need it, apparently. Emma, you've had many situations where you were intervening with organizations where they were having trouble filling the quotas. And they were like, oh, let's bring a coach. Maybe she will uh, sort the problem. And Emma was like, okay, what do you do in a context where the culture is horrible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then you think, then one, I found myself thinking about the ethics of bringing, <laughs> bringing a woman into that space. Uh, is it even right? I think we need to make sure that cultures are uh, good enough for the women to be invited to be there. Is it? Is it good enough? It's like, has it has it been cleaned? <laughs> um, is it appropriate? Is it safe? Uh, and, and there's one thing bringing someone in, but then can you retain them? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the retention piece is very important to think about. I know we agree on that. <laughs> I, I know that we could talk for another hour, right, on, on this. But uh, let's give a huge round of applause to our, to our panelists. I want to thank uh, you all, Emma, uh, Ida, and, and Lena, for, for joining us uh, today. I have a little bit of housekeeping that I need to do on my end. But sure. they're going to stick around uh, for uh, networking. But like I mentioned at the beginning, we uh, host uh, events on, uh, on a weekly basis. And I want to... Um, spend a little bit more time with you tonight, <laughs> just just to stroke the ego a little bit more. But also to mention the the two remaining events that we have uh, for for the uh, for the month. So on uh, March nineteenth, this is the second installment of our series called AI Surge. Uh, this time we're talking about deep fakes uh, and the ethical quandary uh, surrounding them. So deep fakes, as we know, are sophisticated digital creations that use deep learning to produce or alter video content so convincingly that it becomes difficult to distinguish between genuine and fabricated content. Um, and it has proliferated rapidly thanks to the advancements in AI technologies. So we're going to delve into this topic and not look at the not only the technical underpinnings of how deepfakes are created, but also the broader implications that it has on society, politics, and privacy. And uh, it's a huge uh, election year in the U.S., so, uh, you know, our neighbors, <laughs> they, they are already playing games. So I want to look, look into that in a, in a deeper level. On March 26, we're going to host a second event in our sustainability uh, series that's called Sustainable... Uh, solutions. Uh, this time we're going to focus on energy. Uh, Finland stands at the forefront of integrating renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and uh, hydrogen power into its national grid. Uh, the country's commitment to reducing its carbon footprint and increasing energy independence sets it as a benchmark worldwide. Uh, if we're going to be 2035 carbon neutral uh, and be the first country uh, in Europe to do that, uh, we should celebrate that, right? Because <laughs> 
Uh, I know, I know, being married to Finn, it takes a lot to say, I'm great. <laughs> but <laughs> that's a huge, that is a huge target. And if we achieve that, we should all be talking about how we get there and how Finland becomes the first uh, country in Europe to do so. Because the next one is five years behind, right? So how do we leverage those five years? Um, I want to thank you all so much for being here. I want to thank our, uh, all of our speakers uh, once again. Uh, like I mentioned, these events are uh, free and open to the public. Uh, right now, the most important part is for you to network and to mingle and to have some snacks as they get passed by. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Joey. I'll see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>